everybody. Sorry that I can't speak yet in Polish, but give me a couple of years and it will work, I guess. And so let's start first a bit about myself. And I made some journey for Europe during the last 30 or so years, or even longer. So I was born in Hamburg, grew up in Bremen, so northern German. I studied in Berlin, got then my PhD, and then I got interested in industry and went to Roche, and I uh, spent uh, two and a half years as a postdoc. Then I went back to academia and was interested to continue the topic that I got from industry, and that was vitamin D. You will hear about that a bit today from me. My special expertise, I got 32 years ago, started that. In, in Basel, in Geneva, and then turned to Düsseldorf, turned back to Germany, got a dose in there, continued my topic, and then I got in the year 2000 an offer from far away, from Kuopio, uh, from eastern Finland. There are a lot of lakes there, but also rather cold, far more cold than here, so don't worry, I'm, I'm very well adapted to the <laughs> climatic conditions here. You can't, can't shock me about that. Yeah? So in this way, I came now south, yeah? nearly Riviera, okay? <laughs> so, and now I'm here in Ocean, and of course, on one side, I, I'm interested to continue the topic I'm working, as I said, 32 years on, it's vitamin D, but enlarge that. I mean, the topic of nutrigenomics is my topic already since more than 15 years in teaching, in Kuopio, I come to that, so I'm very familiar with the topic nutrigenomics, so you will not only hear vitamin D, but of course, hopefully you all have a good vitamin D state. Okay, um, I want to tell you basically, a hopefully simple enough story that everyone here, irrespective of what your background is, can come with a simple, or goes away with this simple formula. And that is, I'm talking about our life. That means how healthy we hopefully all are and how unlikely we're getting any disease. Yeah? This life has two major components. The one component is what we get from our parents. So the genetics, we can't do much about it. Yeah? That's what our parents gave us. But it's only contributing 20% to the risk. Yeah? While the far bigger aspect is what is called epigenetics. It's something on top of our genes. And I will try to explain it. But even if you don't go into these uh, details, just say, hey, there is something else besides my genes. And this something else is influenced by what we're eating, therefore nutrient genomics, and also the lifestyle we just heard about, yeah, the healthy lifestyle, physical activity, uh, good sleeping, being happy in general, yeah, so just being in a good mood, all these factors influence the epigenetics, and this is what we have in our own hands. So even if you are having a bit bad genes. And here I can tell you the story of my own grandmother, being born more than 100 years ago uh, in, in, in Germany, and, and she had from her parents a high rate of cholesterol. I still have that, not that much as my grandmother, but higher cholesterol level, and you probably know that's not good, it increases the risk of heart attack and stroke. Yeah. But my grandmother, from, I, mean, I, I spent the first years of my life more with my grandmother than with my mother because my mother was still studying, uh, so way very much influenced by my grandmother, and she took, and that was in the 1960s already, very much care on her life because somehow, intuitively, she understood that story, that you have your own self-responsibility for your life, yeah? and therefore she would take in the food being low in cholesterol, trying to avoid this extra risk. Okay? And normally you would say, based on the genes, she may have died with 60 from heart attack. That would be the normal expectation. Yeah, but she got 96, 98 and a half. She died a couple of years ago. But uh, this was 
uh, basically already something in her mind. So in this time of story, yeah, I want to tell you, and I will focus a bit more, what is epigenetic and what can we all do? So if you leave the wrong uh, room, at least take away, hey, it's not my fate what my, my parents gave me, it is what I myself do about it. And this is what, of course, I would like to get into the mind of everyone here in the region, not only you here in the room, that everyone gets the faith and say, yes, it's in my own hand. If I get a disease, if I may get di diabetes, if I may get atherosclerosis, uh, if I may get a heart attack, uh, it is not just falling from heaven, it is under own uh, responsibility. Okay, so that's, that's the story we are working on. Just to give you a very short idea about this 20%. It's so, we all have a genome, yeah? we all are humans, and to 99% we are identical. And just 1%, and 1% we are different. You don't have to go for the details here, but you take it away again. You look your neighbors, and you know if it's not your direct relative system, uh, a mother, father, uh, it is 1% that we're different. Yeah? And this 1% is, of course, influencing the risk if we get into water a disease or if we stay healthy. And here, hopefully, simple enough two different individuals. The genes is here with the capital letters. And you see it is uh, 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 the same letter, and this is representing four different tissues, major tissues, like the brain, like glands, like heart, like intestine. This is all the same in all our body. Our genome is the same. Yeah? This is what we are born with, and that will not change if we're not getting cancer or other diseases affecting the genome directly. But if we compare us with another individual, yeah, in, uh, in a couple of million of these letters, we are different. That make all together 1% of our gene, but 99% are the same. But look on these other symbols here. These are symbols uh, representing the epigenome, this 80%. I want to bring a little bit closer to you. Okay? And that is not only different between the individuals, but it's also different in each of our organs. In our body, you have to think it like Lego pieces, yeah? built of uh, 400 different types of Lego pieces, meaning 400 different types of tissues and organs, yeah? cell types, making our body. And in each of them, this epigenome, this epigenetic is different. Some of it is stable, so a brain cell will always say the brain cell and not decide next day, oh, I want to be a kidney, I want to produce urine. No, the brain cells stay for the rest of their life. So some aspects of the epigenome are stable, but others we can influence by, if you go out running, yeah, 15 minutes or 45 minutes that have been shown is enough to change your epigenome in the muscle. It will not stay forever, so it will also ask, maybe please do it also tomorrow or often enough this week. But you can change that part of your life yeah, by just deciding, I want to go for a run. Or your decision, what you're going to eat. Yeah? It's a very clear influence. So this is the core of the message. So, you have it here, already written again, only 20% is to gene and 80% are in our own hands. Now, this is a slide you see, you will see three times uh, today, and I, I want to guide you through. It basically, the epigenome is something which on one side is very important in the early days of our life, fertilized egg until uh, young children, so the uh, uh, early development, but it's also important in later parts of our life. If you say, hey, that's not my topic anymore, I'm, I'm somewhere here. So I will develop both parts. And here I come again to my formula, or the formula that you see here. So very short, again, an, an initially looking busy slide. This is addressing the first time of life, and also addressing what the Institute is interesting, you know, this uh, animal reproduction. It means 
how efficient is fertilization happening, what is, what type of program happens after that. So what you see, look just on the lines here, it looks like roller coaster. And on the y-axis you see a measurement of the epigenome. You don't have to care what it is at the moment. Well, what you see, uh, the fact that this is a roller coaster in the first days and weeks of life, a lot is happening. So, sperm starts somewhere else, so the male component starts somewhere else than the oocyte, the egg from the, from the mother. Uh, they both have to come to compromise for this uh, epigenome. And then, uh, up and down, it's happening. Okay? And the egg and the programming all these 400 different tissues that our body makes. And this is something happening in the first weeks. So this is the most sensitive time. Yeah? So of course everyone who uh, plans to be pregnant uh, uh, plan well about that because don't have any bad influence on the, uh, on the growing child or on the fetus in the first weeks. It's so sensitive to have the epigenome can change uh, very drastically and then you may have very bad effects. So take care very much. So this is a very most sensitive time of their life where the epigenome plays a big role. Now what is the epigenome? Uh, if I'm going for a physical uh, expression of it, I have a model. A model, sorry, I need no, basically more than three uh, two hands. So my model is, this is basically our, uh, our genome, yeah? and you see the small pearls, yeah? and these pearls are representing something sitting on top of it. And if we have it in a relaxed status like that, it's open. But if you have it like this, it's closed. Okay. So and the difference between open and closed is basically then what you have to understand. So we have regions which are dense, nothing is happening. You have to think of it like Christmas presents. Imagine the whole room is full of Christmas presents, but you allowed out of a thousand presents yeah, to open only a few. Uh, let's say I give you hundred out of thousand. Okay? This 100 you're allowed to open, uh, and you can play whatever is in this, in this presence. But the other uh, 900 you don't, you're not allowed to touch. Then I ask the next person to come, you select your presence, and you will, out of the 1,000 presents, select uh, uh, different ones. And then you have different tools, different uh, plays, whatever you have. Uh, and this is basic, if you're going from one tissue to the other, uh, out of 1,000 possibilities which are wrapped, yeah? you select about 100, yeah? so 10%, and this is then representing what is exactly happening. So what type of toys you have, if you can play Legos or whatever, if you get a computer, whatever these toys now uh, are nowadays. Yeah? So you have different type of tools available for which you can play, and that you can imagine is what makes a liver cell different than a brain cell. But now, imagine, it's not only this decision, this fundamental decision choice, but there are some boxes, uh, maybe differently colored, you may imagine, you can open and wrap again. Yeah? If you go for a run, you can open the toy. It's opening up. Yeah? If you then go to the sofa, it may close again. No, no, I'm not playing anymore. Yeah? So it is a coming and going, it's a dynamic thing, how you get access to this type of toys. Okay? And this is the way you have to see the epigenome. So some things are clearly clear. You have your selection of 100 uh, uh, of the 1,000 presents, plus these extras, yeah, which you can influence yourself. So here's the core of what I want you to understand. And now, these different symbols here are representing here, if it's either closed or open. This is rather close, this is, uh, sorry, this is open, this is rather closed. And now, here you have a different type of food products, mostly plant-based. So something that you find in different type, in tea, in soy, in grapes, uh, in cucumber, cocoa, uh, these molecules, they are influencing uh, whether the, the, the present is closed, 
you have no access, or whether it's open and you have access to that tool. Yeah? So it's the choice of form. So these basically all meant are beneficial. So if you find them in your diet, if you if your diet is composed of this, it's a good thing. Yeah? This is what I can recommend to eat. Okay, but of course there are also bad things that do the wrong direction, so therefore one has to take care what to choose for eating. Then, coming to aging. Yeah? Each of us will age. Uh, this is what we all are conscious about. So, it's starting with zero, and if we're going under the two diagonal nine line means that our chronological age, every year new birthday, yeah? so you see on your passport how old you are, and then the same, uh, the question is, how fit are you? Yeah? How uh, healthy do you feel? Yeah? And if you know 70, or take any other age, take your age, and you think about the people you went to school that means having the same age, and you meet them in whatever uh, occasion, are they fitter than you? Do they look older? Do they look longer? If you, if you do a 100 meters competition, will you win? Will they win? Yeah, whatever competition you, you think about. Yeah? So you have some people who are clearly uh, uh, worse. Yeah? This, this green area is then the older epigenome, the older fit. Yeah? Just think about the, the, the formula. Yeah? So epigenetics, these people with 70, they either 70 years long, something quite good, and they are somewhere down here, so with 70 they still fit. Yeah? Or they did a lot of mistakes and they are probably worse than 90 years. Okay, and 70 years. Here, a real example from 40 people who have been investigated over a, a couple of uh, years. Uh, and, and here's the chronological age, and you see the different dots in the same color, it's the same person. And for simplicity, this is then con combined with this different type of uh, uh, lanes. This is the normal way as we're aging, so if, if the curve goes like this or even like that, it's good. So this is, for example, a good example, but there are also a few bad examples. So somebody is starting with somebody being uh, uh, 80 but probably having a disease, and within two or three years came to the status of 75. Yeah? And you probably know that. Yeah? Somebody gets ill. You know him, you have seen him just last year on, a, on an event, and you meet him and you get a shock like, how has this person aged? How uh, old that this person suddenly got due to a disease, due to whatever event in life? And it basically, the epigenome very drastically changed. But you see also good examples. Here is somebody initially being not being having the uh, age of 50, uh, but already looking from epigenome like 60, but then the curve goes down. So this person made a click in mind and improved, and after two or three years, even looked younger than he started with. Okay? So all these examples are existing and, and basically mean to whatever age, if you're starting young, of course, even better, or even if you're starting old. If you do the right thing, you can influence your life. It's just a question to determine what you need to do. I mean, there are obvious things like physical activity, eating healthy, but there are also personalized things that we have to take care of. So, now uh, we have uh, spoken also about this, this old part of the life, and you hopefully then understand better what I mean, with the whole path of the life is influenced by the epigenome, this 80%. And if I try to summarize, again, a little bit busy slide, um, meaning we have on one side our genes we are born with, this is 20%. Then we have our lifestyle, what we're eating, uh, how much physical activity and so on. And then we have the effect of the epigenome, so what goes for uh, good and bad due to this epigenome, the environmental influences. And then in times of COVID, yeah, we have microbe infection, which also influences, of course, our life, our body very much. Yeah? So these different major factors I see, and they are not separate from each other, they're interlinked. You can see it like a carousel. Here I have major tissues and also the disease that major tissues can get. And they're not separate. Yeah? So if somebody gets, unfortunately, cancer, 
Uh, it's also linked to metabolic disease. For example, somebody being obese having far higher risk of getting cancer than if you are lean, if you're eating well. Okay? And also the risk for allergies and for a number of our neurodegenerative diseases are depending on that. And the core of it is the programming. So what I mean with my model here. Yeah? So deciding if you are dense chromatin, so presents are uh, uh, wrapped and you don't have access to them, or if you have the open chromatin and the dynamic change by the lifestyle. Okay? So that's something what I see and what I also summarized together with a few colleagues in the book Nutrigenomics. This is what I'm lecturing since, or was lecturing the last 15 years in Wapio and summarized in the book and that I hope I can also continue here and can influence uh, more people with this way of thinking. Okay? And just remember, 80% we have it in our own hands. It's our own fact. Okay? So, epigenomics plays a central role. I'm not sure if you have a real clear uh, me, uh, understanding what epigenome made, but it's, if you take the example of the, pres uh, of, the, of the presence being wrapped or not wrapped, or if you take my model here, that's enough for the moment. Yeah? So you don't have to go yet to the, any detail. So now, I already mentioned it, uh, vitamin D is what I'm working since 32 years on, since I started in, in, in uh, hofmann uh, uh, 32 years and, uh, ago. And uh, you probably all know that I, I saw already in uh, uh, Polish TV there is uh, advertisement on, on vitamin D, in radio there's advertisement, which is interesting because in other countries it's not allowed. I wouldn't like that it happens like that. To shake the people and say, hey, you have to take care of your vitamin level, vitamin D level. You may all know the vitamin D basically can be produced in our skin if there is enough uh, sun exposure. In winter it doesn't help because the sun is not high enough, there's not enough EUV because you need the UV component. So then we have to take it up by food or by direct supplementation. Food is not that easy because we have a natural food, just fatty fish, having a bit, but from my point of view, not enough. Now, and there's some fortified food. Uh, uh, that is one way, but the, the best way probably is to take the vitamin D supplementation as a pill. So this is the vitamin D molecule, and that is gets a bit further changed. There are this red extra group to get an active form. Now, and this active form of vitamin D is in fact a hormone. It's not a vitamin, it acts like a hormone. Hormones similar like estrogens. Yeah? I mean, all females in the room know the, uh, the monthly changes of estrogens and the physiological effects it has. Okay, or testosterone for the males is about the same thing. Yeah? Uh, cortisol, all these molecules are acting in a very similar way as this derivative of vitamin D. Yeah? So the vitamin D we are, are swallowing as a pill yeah, is finally acting as a hormone very similar to estrogen for its principle of work. So, then, anyway, I don't want to torture you with the details I was working the last 30 years with. But what you can imagine, or should imagine, this is the molecule vitamin D, the active form. And here is another uh, 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 complex called the vitamin D receptor. And it's acting like a switch. It's like the switch we have in all the rooms, the light switches, all yeah? Yeah, deciding if there is light, how much light is in our rooms. This is basically here a switch and influencing the epigenome. So basically, as there was already when I came here an hour ago, arranged with how much light we have here, uh, uh, people with uh, uh, arranging exactly the lighting, the same way you have to imagine, these type of switches are set so that our epigenome is either open at the right position if you have enough vitamin D, or it is maybe closing, yeah, and then you can't uh, benefit from it. So, by putting the right switches, yeah, you open the epigenome at the right position. So if you have enough vitamin D, you're doing the right programming of the epigenome. Yeah, if you don't have enough, yeah, then the, the room here in Adamoji would be darkish and you wouldn't see anything and you see yeah, something is going wrong here. Okay? 
So, and what we did is we studied, in this example, we did a couple of different studies. One example here with 71 elderly people who were already pre-diabetic, so on the way to develop type 2 diabetes. And we asked them over a um, Finnish uh, winter to swallow every day some vitamin D. And then we measured before and after, uh, and then we, uh, we lo uh, looked on 36 different items and basically checked yes or no. Uh, and the best ones had, I think, in 31 or 32 items a yes. Uh, so this person was very well responding to vitamin D. But the other person, every dot here is a person, had only some 10 of 32 uh, uh, responses. This we call a low response, and you see all the others were in between. And we repeated that also with young, healthy individuals who get about the same uh, uh, scheme. That means, I mean, if I would all ask you to do this experiment here in the room, we probably would have uh, come to a result, a fourth of one in four of us, will be a low responder to vitamin D. Yeah? Being by our life program so that uh, vitamin D doesn't help in the normal doses. Okay? So these people we have to give a personal advice, please take more vitamin D, take more care on your vitamin D status. Okay? So that is hopefully an example for what we can do doing this personalized. And it was it's just an example of vitamin D. You can think of a lot, lot of other things that one can change. And for certain things, we're good responders, everything is fine. As for the people here in green, that's fine, they don't have to worry about vitamin D. But if you get uh, somewhere here, you should worry and you should change something in the life. So, again, this is a busy slide. Take just the main point. We have measured this, and we have classified the persons in high, mid, and low responders. And since vitamin D, sorry, I haven't mentioned that clearly, you probably uh, uh, all know that vitamin D is important for all bones, yeah? but it's also important for our immune system and our muscle function, and also prot uh, protects us in ge against getting cancer. I come to that in the next slide. So these four major aspects, if our vitamin D is in a good shape, yeah, then we are getting the respective response, having good bones, having strong uh, muscles, having a good functional immune system. Think in times of, of, of corona, uh, that's very important. And of course, getting prevented from getting, uh, getting cancer. And, and uh, what vitamin D does, we have here immune cells. You know, our blood has not only red blood cells, but also so-called white blood cells. They belong to the immune system. And these cells basically move through our body and check out if there's somewhere an inflammation, if there's somewhere a virus or bacterium had entered our body and tried to fight it. They experiencing things during their life. And during this experience, yeah, they're getting programmed. And they program the epigenome. So, again, in these cells here, certain regions are closing, others are getting open. And in this way, uh, they are getting perfectly uh, uh, trained for fighting against uh, different type of invaders of our body. Okay? And this programming is helped by vitamin D. So training the immune system to do a good job. And what good job does the immune system do? One important thing is, we have here multiple steps to something very ugly. This is a carcinoma. This is an aggressive tumor. And you may know uh, that if this aggressive tumor even spreads, forms metastasis, goes somewhere else in the body, we may have it first in one place, maybe in the breast, and then it goes to 100 different places, makes 100 new tumors. That's very bad. This is why people die, uh, are dying from cancer, because they have the tumor all over again. So, but this is a process taking 20 years, doesn't come overnight. Yeah? The normal state, this is normal tissue. Sometimes, here and there, in each of us, yeah, every day, some cells are getting crazy. But if vitamin D program immune system is there, they're going back, you know, they, or they get eliminated, and they don't further progress. So you can't call the things back, you know, that go back, go back, go back. You know? But if you have a wrong lifestyle choice, you decide to smoke, 
have a low vitamin D state, state with unhealthy diet, uh, being obese, having not enough physical activity. So doing the wrong programming of the epigenome, this progress is further going until you get this aggressive form of cancer. And that happens, unfortunately, to nearly half of the population. Yeah? Now, 30%, 50% of us will uh, uh, sometimes in life, unfortunately, get a diagnosis of cancer. So let's all work not to belong to 50% by being uh, here. One of the aspects is taking vitamin D, but there are many, many other aspects. This is what I want to get spread into uh, in this program over the next year or decades, uh, that we all can work about it and we all stay here and none of us is getting this nasty uh, uh, disease. Yeah? So it's not only our fate, it's not only in our genes, 20% yeah? is in our genes, uh, we can work against it by having a high, healthy lifestyle. So, good vitamin D status, but many other things that we can do good are important, not running into nasty diseases like cancer. So, for the last time this, this slide, but maybe now you understand at least a bit of the slide what I mean. Yeah? We have a lot of different influences for our life, uh, good and bad, hopefully mostly uh, good, uh, so that at the end this epigenome and the environment, all the influences we're exposed to, uh, come to a happy, to good result. So phenotype or life is in this way identical, meaning we are staying healthy and are getting an, an aging healthy and, and having a very long health span. Uh, going back to my grandmother, she lived independent basically the whole life. Just the three last months uh, she had to get to an, an, an elderly home. Yeah, but 98, more than 98 years independent, healthy life. Yeah, just by her own uh, decision, staying healthy. Okay, now you may ask, what, what do you just want now to do? Yeah, just give you a few glimpses, yeah? and that comes with a concept that we call a digital twin. In fact, by far not our invention. The invention comes from engineers. Just think about the uh, uh, following. Somebody is constructing an airplane. If it's Airbus, if it's Boeing or whatever uh, company, yeah, at earlier times, 100 years ago, this was a uh, trial and error. Yeah, so you ask somebody crazy, we want to fly it, but most likely it was crashing. Okay? So, uh, the people learned that it's far more efficient. You design everything first on computer. Uh, so every engine, every piece of this, uh, of this airplane, you have a computer copy of it. Uh, you build everything together, you let it fly on the computer, uh, you have all different failure measurements, you improve it, and then after everything is on the computer perfect, then you ask the pilot, try it. And I think in the last 20 years or so, I'm not aware of that any plane that was first tried was crashing immediately. Yeah, it is rather perfectly working for engineers. Yeah? So now imagine this for humans. Yeah? So if we could manage to get a copy, a digital copy of ourselves, at least sufficiently copy, that means our main properties, and you may imagine what I'm adding on, if we know our epigenome, yeah? of course also our genome would be helpful. If you have this information, and in particular, can we know how dynamic we are in certain responses? So what I'm aiming on on one side is to initiate a number of intervention studies. So wh whoever is interested can participate and for example swallows vitamin D or there's something else, health exercise. We can have a lot of different ideas of things being good. And you basically have the status before and after. And these different things before and after getting compared a computer is, is, is filled with this information and creates then a, a, a model, a digital model, a, a, a computer model of us. Okay? And once we have this data, the idea is, instead of trying everyone and saying, you try this, try this, and a trial and error type of thing, yeah, like the airplanes uh, 100 years ago, yeah, no, 
we have a digital model and we know you and then one can design you should do the following you should take this you should eat that and you can give them the optimized recommendation to a person and not just the general thing yes each of us should move enough each of us should eat healthy yeah but yeah, we all humans we do here and there some mistakes and and, and yeah, I also like chocolates a lot, so even if it's not that healthy, I must admit, yeah? something like that. So here is the future, what I see, that we can have a prevention of major diseases by knowing us as much as possible. And using this idea of a digital twin, yeah, so therefore there will be a lot of computational work. Yeah, so I'm trying to recruit as much as people with computational knowledge rather than people doing some pipetting in the lab. Of course, also these we will need, but uh, the focus, the emphasis is on computer work. Yeah, this is what I'm not seeing, seeing not only by nutrigenomics, for the whole biology field. It turns more and more into something you spend hours on a computer and you spend minutes in doing an experiment. So, in future we use a digital twin of us, a computer copy, that's my vision yeah, of the next, let's say, 20 years, okay? And, uh, yeah, I think I, I took more than promised time, sorry, but I hope I could entertain you a bit, okay? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christian.